Welcome to the fifth panel of our uh, virtual uh, PSA Parliament's conference. Thank you for coming. Uh, this panel is about analysing representation and we've got uh, four uh, brilliant uh, speakers and papers coming up. We've got Rebecca McKee talking about who works for MPs representation in the House of Commons. Sadar Aziz talking about the Iraqi Kurdistan parliament stuck in the middle. Wang Lung Ting uh, talking about professional representation and the effects of prior occupation on MPs' attention on policies. And we have Fotis Fitzsilis talking about digital tools to bridge the representation gap. But for the time being, we'll uh, concentrate on representation and I'll hand you over to Rebecca McKee and her paper. Wonderful, thank you Stephen. So yeah, I'm Rebecca McKee, as Stephen said, and I work at the Constitution Unit at University College London. And the research that I'm presenting today is about MP staff, those who work in MPs offices, both in the constituency and in Westminster, or indeed from home, like many of us are at the moment. We know quite a lot about MPs now, who they are and the work that they do. They do a huge amount of work and it's ever growing, but it is supported by just over 3000 members of staff. While we know more information than ever before about the MPs, we know incredibly little about those who work for them. And MPs employ their own staff directly. So they're essentially running 650 small businesses with around three or four members of staff each. There's little HR oversight and no formal hiring practices. And as the head of the businesses, MPs are setting the direction of work and the roles that the staffers have. So in essence, staffers are working on behalf of the MP. And in doing this, they sit at what has been termed the representational nexus. So this means they represent the constituents to the MP and they also represent the MP to the constituents. These staff have multiple roles, so they're gatekeepers, they are controlling access to constituents and interest groups, vice versa, they're resources, they're providing research and policy advice, they're channels linking the constituency to Westminster, and they are providers of essential administrative support. The positions that they hold though are unusual, they're not public servants in a way that a civil servant is, as I said they're employed directly by the MP. <clears throat> They also arrive at these positions in a variety of different ways, rather than through a traditional external or centralised hiring process. And so they can lack some of the usual employment protections or support. But these roles can also derive significant benefits. So, for example, some roles can be stepping stones to a career as a parliamentarian um, or political jobs outside of parliament. And staffers may be able to trade on some of the valuable experience that they've gained. But Crucially, the ability to make use of these networks and opportunities isn't afforded equally to each role. So, for example, the experience um, of a junior uh, administrator in the constituency of office will be different from a parliamentary researcher in the Westminster office, just by the nature of the type of work that they do, exposure to Westminster politics or to the constituency and the people that they're interacting with as part of their job. So given the lack of information available about staffers, I wanted to look further at this group I hope in the future we can do far more research into the representation of MP staff, but for now, at least the main hurdle is starting with some of the basics and just shedding a bit of light on who it is that works for MPs and what they do. Um, what I'm presenting to you isn't a finished paper, but it is going to be a constitution unit report coming out later this year um, and several papers coming from that because of the survey I ran that I'll explain covers quite a wide range of things. Um, so I would really appreciate feedback on what I've done so far, but also kind of what I'm planning to do and insights you think would be helpful for the report and publications. So the data that I am looking at for this research, um, this kind of triangulation of different sources, to my knowledge, there's not a full publicly available list of those who work in an MP's office. So the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority in the UK, they hold information on all IPSA funded employees. Then you've got the Pass Office hold information on all staff with the security pass. And um, this misses out various people for different reasons and isn't one list. 
and it's purely a symptom of the way staff are employed but it gives us an idea of kind of where we're starting from with the lack of information at all about who works for MPs. Where there is publicly available data there's not always loads of detail so IPSA collect data, information on gender and whether they're connected party but we're missing information around ethnicity and disabilities and quite a lot of other characteristics. Um, so yeah I looked at a few different sources there's loads of FOIs up on the IPSA website which were quite useful existing IPSA data and um, some discussions with members of staff there and then I, I ran my own survey of MP staff like an audit kind of of who works there and a bunch of supplementary questions of that. So the survey was sent out to MPs offices between August and November 2019. Um, ideally it would have been out there longer but there was the December 2019 general election. Um, so contact details for MP staff they're not consistently publicly available so I sent the emails out to the MPs offices um, with the assumption that many offices it's the staff who monitor the email account anyway. I sent out several emails but also posted some surveys to Westminster and constituency offices for example posting them to Sinn Féin constituency offices. Um, it's hard to get a definitive number of people working for MPs at any one time but from the IPSA data of that period there were approximately 3,133 3, people employed so I received uh, 514 responses giving an individual response rate of about 16.4%. So it's comparable with other surveys such as Megan Clotier's work in Canada, um, where she's surveyed constituency staff there. So um, a disclaimer that the aim of this project is actually to look at the ethnic diversity of MP staff and their experiences, but the survey hasn't given me enough response rates responses from um, BAME staffers to be able to look into that so this is just the first part and I'm going to be doing more interviews and I've got a strategy going forward to run some workshops and stuff like that. Um, I can talk to you more about waiting if you're interested um, but just to say it's weighted by the party of the MP because as you can see on this slide um, although response rate was good overall and it was good on gender and job families and that kind of thing by um, MP's party it wasn't great so I've waited on that and that fits well. Um, so who works for an MP? Um, the image for many of someone who works for an MP perhaps is a younger male working as a parliamentary researcher or policy focused role and those are because those are often the most visible kind of staffers for those who are familiar with the Westminster offices. But actually it only tells part of the story so an average staffer if we take an average of all the different characteristics which we can't really do but just for now um would be a, a female woman 37 years old white a university graduate and state comprehensive educated so there are more women than men working uh, in Parliament for MPs, average age is 37, 93% response rate to my survey was white, but as mentioned um, before, I'm not sure how much of the picture that tells. 73% um, are university educated, at least with an undergraduate degree, and then you've got 61% are state comprehensive. 15% went to an independent, so fee paying private school, which is almost double the average for the UK population, but it's less than half of that of MPs, so it's there's a path potentially there. Um, actually, 6% of staffers are Oxbridge graduates and 52% uh, are graduates from Russell Group University. And then also the amount of time someone works for an MP can vary hugely. So from one month to over 35 years, the average is three years and three months. Um, women stay in the jobs and of, on average longer, so around four years, compared with two and a half years for male employees. Um, also from the survey I can tell you that 49% so half of staffers have an undergraduate degree in politics so either a straight degree or a joint um, joint honours. The most common undergraduate degree discipline is the social sciences followed by the humanities so 90% of all respondents had a degree in one of these or joint honours and only 6% have got an undergrad degree in an applied science or a professional degree and 4% in natural sciences or four more sciences and I say this because I want to go on and look on a bit more about how well supported Parliament is with the growth of the kind of work that they're having to grapple with um, but that's just also an interesting thing to note. 
So one of the things that I wanted to get across today is the differences across the job families that staff work in. Um, and I think it need, it's something I found very interesting and needs further probing. But job families are the way that the employment of MP staff is structured. So staffing roles are broken into three job families. Set, um, these are set by IPSA. They're administrative, executive, and research. And you can see on this slide, some, these are the job titles that fit within here. Um, fit within the different families and there's tiers as well so those tiers are like seniority and they match onto pay bands as well so mps have to use uh, this as a guide for hiring it, it takes job descriptions pay and job titles um administrative jobs as you can see are more clerical roles executive jobs are caseworkers with more contact with constituents um, and research jobs are policy focused um working with the mp and their westminster work and something to note, and what I've been told by people who work for MPs, is that they actually don't feel that these job descriptions are that helpful in describing the work that they do. There's a lot of blending between that. Um, IPSA did run a review of the job titles last year, and they have changed slightly, so we'll just have to keep an eye on whether that's helped anything. Um, but I actually did find that there are patterns um, by the job family, so they actually have been quite helpful in that way. Um, just as a bit of uh, context within the administrative job family, so the first column, around 75% work in the constituency office versus 25% in the Westminster office. The executive job family, the middle one, um, is 90% based in the constituency, so very heavily constituency focused, but the opposite is true for research. So 80% of them work in the Westminster office. So it starts to help us to see how people in the different job roles might have different experiences and take different things out of the job and how these benefits or otherwise might be unequally distributed. So then if we break this down by the gender of staff, um, in line with some expectations we might have, there are a higher portion of women working in the um, administrative job family than men. Um, the executive roles are quite balanced, um, but for research roles, we see that there's 40% 43% of men working in a research job compared to 28% of women. So the administrative and the research roles are kind of flipped. There's also interesting differences within the job families. So that you look at job titles. So there's chief of staff and office managers are both senior administrative job titles. They have the same general duties and responsibilities according to the IPSA guidelines and the same pay band. But I find that, um, so I found 69% of office managers were women and on the flip side, 65% of chief of staff were male. So again, there's some interesting stuff that needs to be picked apart there about um, gendered differences in job titles. Um, and going back to how long staffers work in their job, administrative staff are there for an average of 5.3 years, executive ones are there for 2.8 years and research staff are there, there at the shorter end for 2.6 years. So if you break the job families down by university as well, uh, if you look at Oxbridge, so of administrative staff, 4.4% uh, of them are Oxbridge graduates and executive uh, staff of 4.7, but then research staff are 12.4. So this is where a lot more Oxbridge graduates, when they're coming into the system, those are the kind of jobs they're going into. And for Russell Group universities, there's a similar pattern, although smaller differences. One of the other things I thought would be interesting to look at now we're seeing these patterns around job families um, is what motivated staff to do their job. So why did they take, take up a job with an MP? And it's something I can look at from the survey that I conducted. So there's a battery of questions I asked asking respondents to pick all that apply. So I'm showing you the percentages of or the amount of people in each category who tick yes to this each statement. And I think they're in line with what we'd now expect based on what I've just said. Um, so re researchers feel more strongly that working for an MP helps them get a job in the future, that it's a stepping stone for a career in politics, that they wanted to gain experience working in Parliament. They're also more likely to say they took the job because they had a keen interest in politics, although this is high across all of the job families. Um, that kind of makes sense with the work that they're doing, but it also explains the higher turnover and short lengths of employment slightly, um, people who are coming in to gain some experience and move on. For administrative staff, they're more likely to say that the MP, um, they like the MP and what they stand for. And that fits with, and it's similar for executive as well, fits with what we know about the role. It's um, administrative work, it's a very personal role. It's a longer term position, as we saw, 
um, and it's more likely to be in the constituency office, so probably hired from the constituency as well. The responses for the executive job role reflect the role, the fact again that the role is more likely to be based in the constituency, um, so being far more likely than a researcher to say they wanted to make a difference to the local community. So different motivations that we're finding some patterns here as well. And I also broke this down by male and female, and I think it, it fits with the patterns that's emerging about the gender role divides between the job families as well. Um, you can see there with like the uh, what well, yeah, wanting to make a difference to the local community, um, experience working in parliament, those kind of what we explained with the job families is, is coming out here as well. Um, so do the differences across the job families matter? But what I've shown is that there's a variation for who works for MPs um, across the board, but well, some variation, um, but more significantly across the job families. So this matters because expectations are that policy focused roles in Westminster have access to more lucrative networks, they can lead to good and well paid job once the staff are leaves. Um, some of the administrative and executive roles based in the constituency don't have access to these networks. Um, while they're gaining a huge amount of experience in the constituency, it's possibly not as lucrative for future jobs. Um, but it's not to say that everyone needs to be in a Westminster policy facing role, it's just for us to be able to think about um, that if there are patterns such as women or those who didn't go to Oxbridge or Russell Group University are more likely to go into some roles in the administrat administrative and executive job families and the opposite is the case for research roles, then it's worth looking more closely at why this might be, especially when it's coupled with the informal hiring practices. Um, we have in the UK House of Commons, which offer a rather opaque view of how staffers are employed in different roles. Um, I think we need to know more about how that process of hiring works, what experiences the staff have in their roles, and what their career progression is like. And so much of this I actually covered in my survey. Um, and also, as I said, I'm going to be doing interviews in the future. So I look forward to presenting more of that to you soon. But the main point here, I think, is that these staff um, play an important part of they're an important part of our democracy and they're also an important part of the system of representation in our democracy and representation in this arena matters because as I said the staff are at this representational nexus presenting parliament out to the world and they're presenting the world back into parliament um, so I think this hopefully sets some interesting starter points for us to discuss. <laughs> Thank you.